Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatist 1919, I take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 51st lecture of our lecture series. Calcutta Comparatist 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of academic study of Indian languages and literatures envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the University of Calcutta. Later in 2005, a new department called Comparative Indian Languages and Literatures was established, which still continues to carry research in, in Indian languages. Calcutta Comparatist 1919 took inspiration from this history and it is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas. We are organizing online lectures on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields. Your remarkable skills will be a great addition to our team. We look forward to a mutually beneficial relationship with you. Thank you for joining us today. Now I would like to request our host, Aratrika Ganguly, to introduce the speaker. Aratrika Di. Yes, thank you, Suparna, for this wonderful introduction. A very warm welcome to all of you. A very good afternoon to Professor Chinmay Tumbe and all our participants for today. Now we'll introduce our speaker. Professor Chinmay Tumbe is with the Department of Economics at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He holds a master's from the London School of Economics and Political Science and a doctorate from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. He was the John Monnet Postdoctoral Fellow at the Migration Policy Center, European University Institute in Florence, Italy in 2013 and was with the School of Public Policy and Governance, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad from 2014 to 16. He has also worked in academic, corporate and government institutions in India, UK and Italy, served on an inter-ministerial working group on migration and his research has been featured in journals, newspapers and several policy portals. His research interests include migration studies, urban economics, business and economic history. Professor Tumbe has published two very important books. One is the India Moving a History of Migration in 2018. And last year he published The Age of Pandemics 1817 to 1920, How They Shaped India and the World. Today, his lecture's topic is Migration and the Pandemics, based on his two famous books. Professor Tombe, the virtual stage is all yours now. You can please begin your lecture. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me over. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to speak. It's an ongoing series for long. Uh, so thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, I'm going to speak, be speaking about migration and pandemics, which are uh, two topics very close to my heart. I've written uh, two books on them. Uh, and in, in a way, in a very strange way, both, of course, are connected in the sense that when you actually think about it, you really cannot have a pandemic, for example, without some migration. You know, for a pandemic to happen, you need to have some movement of people for disease to spread. And of course, migration on itself is a big topic on its own right. And last year, of course, in 2020, when the pandemic hit the world, when India took this uh, decision to lock down, what unfolded after that was an un not unprecedented, but you know, a massive uh, a crisis, unprecedented in the sense that the railways were shut down and people had to walk and so on. Uh, and so my migrant workers, their plight suddenly came into uh, limelight globally. Uh, and in the context of the pandemic, of course, to understand migration, becomes a very uh, important uh, phenomenon. So what I'm gonna do is you know, go through certain slides and my voice will be there in the background. Uh, and so I'll start the presentation now. Right, so uh, this is what happened last year. You know, as I said, this uh, coronavirus, when it came to India, it was a, a fairly, uh, you know, a kind of major event uh, when we saw these shocking visuals of people leaving homes uh, and walking back. And yet 2020, what the sites that we saw were there earlier as well. 
And I'm going to show you another image, for example, and this one is from 1897 during the plague pandemic in Bombay, right? And what you see on this image on the left, both are images of migrant workers fleeing the city. And it's a very important image because migrants usually come to the city. They're drawn to the city for all the opportunities that cities provide. And yet these two images taken, you know, literally more than 100 years apart from each other, they denote the flight from the city going back to the villages. And, and so on the left, what you see is a, is a still from a sketch rather from um, um, Bombay, where plague you know, uh, arrived in great gusto in 1896, 97. Uh, and so that what I'm trying to do out here in this in this particular slide is to kind of uh, emphasize that pandemics have happened in the past, and it is important to understand these interconnections between pandemics and migration. And it has a it, it has a very strong public policy orientation in the sense that could we have averted the crisis last year? What do we learn from the crisis last year? And what can we do going forward to basically enable a, a better system of migration? And also so that a, in a future pandemic, you know, uh, what kind of steps, what, have, what are the learnings from last year's crisis that we uh, take forward with us? So that's what I'm going to be talking about. First, a bit about the contours of migration in India. Who moves? Where, where are they moving? Understanding the migration corridors of India. And then after that, I'm going to be talking about pandemics of the past. Uh, and then eventually, I'm going to talk about uh, both these interconnections between pandemics and migration. So I'll start this story with this particular image from the Illustrated London News uh, in the late 19th century. And it shows you, of course, different ways of movement. And throughout history, until the arrival of the railways, which is the image right at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that you know the tr mode of transport was fairly slow, but it of course happened. And what you see out here is camel caravans, palki docks, tramps, of course, elephants, ekka. And at the e end of this panel is the railways. And the British, what they were trying to do in this, you know, uh, were kind of emphasizing the supremacy of the railways uh, and and kind of you know just uh, showing how fundamentally they had transformed speed and distance in the Indian subcontinent. Now, why am I showing this is because this is really one of the major landmarks in the history of mobility or migration, where people started moving much faster within the subcontinent, right? So as the railway network enfolded across the Indian subcontinent from the 1850s to say the early 20th century, suddenly this entire economy of migrant work picked up great, with great speed. It's of course true that, in, as I pointed out in my book, we've always had some migration uh, coastal navigation, coastal-based migration was also there. So it's not the case that the train created migration, but the train quickened the pace of migration. And that's why suddenly, you know, we started getting migration corridors because people could spend now extended periods of time away from home, knowing that they can go back home very quickly. Earlier, it would take weeks or months to get, go back home. Now it would take, it would be a matter of days. So the railways cons considerably transformed the whole idea of migration itself. As a result of this and other factors, for example, you have famines of the late 19th century, you have uh, the rise of cities like Bombay or Calcutta in the late 19th century, they kind of created a huge demand for labor. There was demand for labor within India, there was demand for labor in industrial centers within India, and there was also demand for labor in the plantation economies outside India. As a result of which, what I argue in my book is that it led to one of the world's greatest voluntary and long-lasting migration streams of human history, what I call as the Great Indian Migration Wave. And I'm going to try and explain to you as to why this migration wave, which is ongoing, is so important. It covers many districts of India. Many of you are part of this migration wave, if you're watching this. Many of you have met people who are part of this migration wave. Uh, and it's important to understand eventually, of course, in the context of pandemics. So I don't have too many slides on, you know, uh, numbers, but this is probably the only slide I have, and it's important to show it for two districts of India, Ratnagiri and Udupi, both on the western coast, just to kind of emphasize what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a pattern of migration where you, it is usually the men who are moving away for work for extended periods of time. Often they are spending years in the city, and then of course coming back, but coming back much later. You know, that is they're coming back, say, after every 10 months for a holiday, but they work in the city and then they retire. 
And what this chart shows you is from the x-axis in 1901 to 2011, that is every census year, and the y-axis is the sex ratio, females per thousand males. So a higher number on this tells you there are more women in that place than men. And you'll see that India, famously Amartya Sen had said, was a country of missing women. right? And so if you see our sex ratio at the India level, it's relatively lower. That is what that means is that uh, the all India sex ratio reflects some amount of gender discrimination, as many studies have shown. That is why it is fairly skewed. But in certain districts of India, what I've argued is that there's this phenomenon of the missing men, not because of gender discrimination per se, but because the men of those places are not found there, they're outside. So the flip side of these sex ratios of Ratnagri and Udupi is the sex ratio of, say, Mumbai, or the sex ratio of Kolkata in the early 20th century, which were essentially male ghettos. And this has huge salience when we start talking about cities like Surat, Delhi today, and what happened uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in last year's pandemic context. Because we can't understand last year's pandemic and migration crisis without understanding the nature of migration today in Indian cities. Now, what this chart also shows you is how persistent mass male migration has been in two districts, Ratnagri and Udupi on the west coast of India. Now, this is, of course, dramatic. In other districts, it's not so dramatic. But what I'm pointing out is that a large part of India, the red districts that you're seeing on this map, belong to what I'm calling as the Great Indian Migration Wave. And there are three features of this migration wave. It is firstly remittance-based, which means the people who are working in the cities, they are sending a lot of money back home. It is semi-permanent, which means that they're not setting down completely in the cities. And it is, of course, male-dominated. I'll talk about women and migration in a bit, but for now, I'm just going to focus on male-dominated work-related migration. Now, about one in six households, therefore, today, you know, uh, have somebody outside for work. So if you walk in the average village of India, one in six actually have somebody outside the village. Now, this particular map that you see comes from the National Sample Survey 2007-8 data. You might say this is 13 years old, haven't things changed? But what I'm arguing in my book and elsewhere is that this map that you're seeing is very similar to what you would have seen in the early 20th century, which means these red shaded districts that you're seeing have had a history of mass male migration for more than a hundred years, which means that when the pandemic hit Bombay city in 1897, and when the pandemic hit Bombay city or Mumbai in 2020, in both those places, in both of those times, migrants started going back. Right? And so uh, it is the same sort of what we call a circular migration, which is happening. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this map. The two districts I mentioned earlier, you know, Ratnagri, which is out here, Udupi, which is out here, they're on the west coast of India. So, but it's not just Udupi and Ratnagri. It's also all of Kerala. Right? And much of that migration is not happening within India anymore. Much of that is going to the Gulf. So the Persian Gulf countries absorb a lot of labor from Kerala. But you'll see that even in a state like Gujarat, where a lot of migrants go to today, there are districts like Ambreli and so on, which are sending people to Surat. Large part of Rajasthan is sending people to Delhi, uh, Surat, and so on. Much of the Himalayan economy, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, send people to Delhi. Much of Eastern UP, Bihar, are the classic traditional labor pools of India sending out labor. Coastal Orissa is under the belt. 100 years back, they used to go to uh, Burma, they used to go to Rangoon also some of them from Malaysia. Today, most of them go to Gujarat. They have a lot of them work, working in the Surat synthetic textile uh, firms. And then if you go down south, even in Tamil Nadu, you'll find certain districts which are you know, around the tip of the subcontinent, which uh, show this property of mass male migration. Not so much the Northeast and not so much of Central India. You know, so much of Deccan India actually is not part of what I call the Great Indian Migration. There are some exceptions, and I've pointed out four circles on this map. And these four circles are what we call a seasonal migration. So we're making a distinction in terms of short-term seasonal, which is migration for two to three months, and typically in the construction sector, typically in harvesting operations, uh, some of them in manufacturing, but they are much shorter. They're typically not more than six or eight months of the year. Now, unfortunately, these migrations are also the most kind of exploited uh, migrations of India, which means that prospects of upward mobility are limited. These migrations tend to happen through a contractor. Um, uh, so this whole contractor Raj that we see in India, you know, is kind of uh, uh, using 
uh, these particular catchment areas and where are they they are at the confluence of gujarat uh, maharashtra and rajasthan a lot of districts here districts out uh, here in uh, chatisgarh district in odisha uh, districts in this uh, uh, telangana uh, area and these districts are uh, don't exhibit the classic properties of the great indian migration wave uh, because the sex ratios are not that skewed and so on but nevertheless they are migration districts so we are making a distinction between the red shaded districts which are remittance based semi permanent and the shorter term and collectively they form what we call as circular migration so the red shaded districts are pretty much sending people in the entire urban informal economy that we see today so if you are living in a city in india the security guards the tailors the plumbers the cooks the domestic helps this vast economy that we have of mostly migrant labor is coming from these districts you know, so that is the kind of work that they do of course many of them are working construction as well but a lot of that construction work is also coming from other parts of india like those four circles now collectively these circular migrants number over most estimates would suggest more than 100 million people right and india's workforce is now more than 400 or 500 million people so we are saying about a quarter to even maybe a third of the workforce of india is migrant labor right and so that's a huge chunk of migrant labor but it's not just migrant labor it is highly circular which means these migrants come with the psychology of actually never going back they come with the psychology of oh, sorry they come with this uh, psychology of never settling they 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 coming with the psychology of always going back to their ancestral place this is quite different from the migration that you're seeing in china where both men and women are moving in large numbers uh, to uh, cities whereas in india it's mostly the men who are making this transition especially for work now why is migration in india internal migration in india so masculine you know or uh, it couple of explanations on the destination side sometimes it is hostility so migrants are not able to find a foothold in cities or even countries like the persian gulf if there are certain destination region factors so think of very expensive housing for example even at the low income level if you want to buy a flat in mumbai it is exorbitant so it's almost impossible for migrants to often get a foothold in a city and automatically the strategy then is to earn as much save as much remit as much and build a nice sort of nest home back uh, in the village uh, on the other hand of course uh, you also have citizenship policies policies for example in the gulf country so the reason why so many kerala's come back from the gulf is simply because you're not allowed to settle there so this is what we can call as destination region factors which create circular migration on the other hand we also have source region factors and in much of north india you'll find a lot of cultural norms for example which restrict women from moving out right and so there's this whole taboo about women moving out uh, there uh, you know the women are expected to stay at home uh, looking after the land and in-laws and it's only after the typically the death of the in-laws that the woman moves uh, in the south it's relatively different but not necessarily so what's happening is that you have two region two reasons you have the source re- region factors and the destination region factors both of them combining in india to make migration very circular okay so what this means is actually that cities in india when you think of cities and many of us think that oh cities are too big migrants are pouring into cities every day the fact is that for every young migrant who's coming to a city there are also old migrants who are going back permanently because they have finished their 10 15 20 30 years living into the city so one way to see some of india's major cities is this constant churn between new migrants taking up from where old migrants have left this is just to tell you about how migration urbanization are related you'll see that one part of india this circle out here stretching across eastern up bihar and this part is you know unurbanized and that is also where a lot of out migration takes place but on the other hand you have kerala which is fairly urban on this side and it is also a high out migration state so can we say then that urbanization which is often a proxy for relative incomes and so on if we get more incomes will migration stop is migration in india purely a story of poverty it turns out that it's not only of course you know incomes matter people are moving for better economic opportunities but it is not the case that incomes are the only thing 
So I'm going to present this paradox to you. For example, if you look at Bihar, which is out here, and if you look at Kerala, which is out here, now they are poles apart on the ladder of development. Right? Kerala is much richer, much healthier than Bihar. And yet the same rates of outmigration exhibit in both these states. So think about it. One of India's richest states and one of India's poorest states have similar rates of outmigration. And that's because the fundamental driver of migration is population density on arable land. What that means is that there's only that much that arable land can support. And so beyond a particular sort of uh, critical threshold, there's a, a, there's, a, there's a pressure for people to move out to eke out a living. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a relatively rich state like Kerala or a relatively poor state like Bihar. What it also means is that these, unless this pressure fundamentally reduces, only then will outmigration actually stop. Right? And that is why it is only when fertility, actually the other demographic pillar, dro starts dropping as it has crashed in Kerala, that eventually you're going to see outmigration rates fall because they're going to be fewer and fewer people sort of uh, you know, applying pressure on that uh, piece of arable land. So that is why we are seeing that outmigration rates in Kerala could be dipping in the near future because fertility rates have crashed substantially. You're not going to see that in Bihar for several decades. So in our lifetimes, Bihar will continue to send out a lot of migrants. So what are the types of migration? You know, uh, of course, there's international and internal. So that's the most fundamental. Uh, there's voluntary and involuntary, which is also fairly fundamental. And if you're really interested to know about international migration or how India's diaspora is spread around the world, uh, aspects of you know how Indians reach Fiji, Mauritius, Guyana, then I'd suggest you read a chapter in my book called Diaspora and Dreams. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, that out here. On involuntary migration, you know, in my book, I have a chapter called Partitions and Displacements. And that tells you about different displacements that have, that have happened in Indian history. Again, I'm not going to talk about that too much out here. What I focus on is you know, some other aspects. So one is about duration of migration. Uh, and as I pointed out, you can look at migration in India broadly as temporary, semi-permanent or permanent. And the bulk of migration in India for work is seasonal or semi-permanent, or what we'd call as circular. Now, people move for a variety of reasons. Income is, of course, one, as I mentioned, density, so lack of opportunities, as people would say. Uh, but the people also move because of a transfer. People move for education. People move for marriage, right? And so marriage is one of the biggest reasons for ma uh, migration in India. In fact, virtually every adult woman in India is a migrant. The census captures more than about 300 million women as migrants. So that's simply because, you know, uh, uh, by the definition of migration, which is basically on the basis of either place of birth or place of last residence, if you have moved, and you've stayed typically more than six months, then you're classified as a migrant. So most women in India, adult women, are actually considered to be migrants. Right? But that, that is more short distance migration and uh, not so much of long distance migration. The other thing about migration is who moves. So I've talked about gender. That is, women are moving much more for marriage. They're, of course, also moving many times for marriage and then working, in which case, unfortunately, the census captures as a, them as marriage migrants, though actually they could be work migrants. Uh, but it's also the case that if you look at unmarried people, then men are dominating the migration streams. Now, this is also changing. In Chhattisgarh, for example, you have many corridors emerging where you know women are also going, single women are migrating out. There are a lot of textile clusters in South India which are absorbing a lot of this labor, which is coming from single uh, women. Now, caste also, of course, matters. I pointed out seasonal migration at the short term ends. They are disproportionately represented by the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. And this other thing, the Great Indian Migration Wave, is actually disproportionately represented by what we'd call as the general category or uh, other backward classes. Uh, religion matters in some places, but it, it's the region which matters more than religion. So, for example, if you're in Eastern UP, if you're in Gorakhpur or Azamgarh, it really doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Muslim, or Christian. Out-migration, the frenzy for migration cuts across religion right but whereas if you're in central india it doesn't again matter you know which religion you are basically you're just generally less likely to migrate part of that geographic uh, difference I've, I've pointed out is because of density but it's also because of history and i you know start point started out this talk by pointing out that the railways and a variety of factors stimulated labor migration in the late 19th century 
And over time, they've created a sort of persistent effect so that those same districts are sending out people even today. Okay, so why do people migrate? I've already pointed out to this. I'm just gonna talk about one more thing called anonymity. Uh, a lot of people also migrate actually to escape the sort of strong social gaze that happens in Indian villages. And that is why famously, for example, Ambedkar had pointed out that migration is a rural to urban migration is a great thing in India, uh, precisely because uh, people can get rid of the caste system. Now, of course, we know most sociologists and economists would say that caste is you know, alive and kicking in cities. Neighborhoods are also segregated on the basis of caste. But all I'd say is that caste in the city is still quite different from caste in the village. So what people are often you know, moving to cities is in terms of relative difference in how caste is working. It is nobody's case that you know, caste has disappeared in Indian cities, but it is much tougher for many aspects of the caste system to work. And that is why a lot of people seem to be prospering. There are studies on Dalit entrepreneurship which show, for example, how important migration is to be able to experiment uh, and succeed. Uh, because often you require a lot of failures in entrepreneurship before you can succeed. And when you migrate and are anonymous, it is easier to fail and then eventually succeed. So very interesting work which is happening on those lines. Uh, there's also, of course, economic distress. There's no doubt then when there's a drought uh, or when there's a tsunami, for example, in coastal Orissa, uh, there is no option but for people to move. Right? And so broadly, often migration scholars characterize this as pull and push factors. Now I'm gonna start talking about pandemics. Uh, I've given you some idea of you know, how migration in India looks, more than 100 million migrant workers and so on. Uh, pandemics is not new in India. Uh, for those of you who are thinking that pandemics have never happened in India and so on, I've written a book now called The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920, in which I argue that this period claimed over 70 million lives in pandemics, of which you know, more than half of that global toll was in India alone. And these pandemics relate, pertain to three diseases, cholera, plague, and influenza. Now, this map, for example, tells you the death rate of India. And you'll see how from 1870s, it was actually increasing to phenomenally high levels. For example, today, the death rate of India is something like seven per thousand, right? Now, that this number that you're seeing out here is nearly six times. And in the case of 1918, you know, nearly 10 times as high as the death rate today, right? So these were shockingly high figures to start with. Until 1920, this was pretty much how mortality was in India. But, you know, from the 1870s, it actually starts increasing, you know, and that was partly because of famines like 1878 and 1900, and famines were closely associated with cholera. Then you also got plague, for example, in 1907 was a plague, 1908 was malaria. But 1918 was the big year of Indian history. And that's when influenza came and influenza hit, you know, really hard. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I estimate that about 20 million Indians died in the span of a few months, 20 million, is, you know, something like two crore people. Today, our COVID numbers are only 150,000 in relative comparison. So this was a deadly sort of moment of, uh, you know, uh, pandemics in Indian history. And there are a lot of interesting nuggets about this. I would urge you to read the book, you know, uh, for, for that uh, part. Now I'm going to talk more about you know, pandemics and migration. And so I presented this picture in the beginning, which is about the plague. And so let me talk a little bit about the plague. The plague you know, comes to India. Uh, firstly, the plague was always there in India in some form or the other. What we'll say is the plague was endemic in certain parts of India. For example, there was a report on the Mahamari, like what we call pandemics today. The word Mahamari was used in the middle of the 19th century to describe plague in Gadwal, for example, or you know, in, in North India, in the hilly regions of North India. And plague as a disease was usually, uh, uh, I mean, we now know that a lot of it can be transmitted via rodents or rats and fleas to human beings. And the case fatality rate was tremendous, uh, something like about 80%, right? which means if you happen to get plague, there was over eight out of 10 chance that you would die. Right. So this was a really, truly really terrifying disease. In comparison, COVID case fatality rates, we are saying is something like one or 2%, uh, even if it is under 10%, you know, we are concerned. Now think about case fatality rates of 80%, there's something else altogether. So when so plague was not as virulent 
as COVID, as the flu or influenza, but at the same time, when it struck, it could kill a lot of people. So obviously when plague came uh, to Bombay, the British were very scared that it would move on from here into Europe. And remember, Europe had faced the Black Death uh, in the 14th century, which wiped out by some estimates one third of their population. So the, the British were very, very scared as to you know, what they should be uh, doing. So in the context of the plague, the British embarked on a series of high surveillance measures, which proved to be very ineffective in the sense that they started you know, having body searches. It was a very brutal, uh, even repressive at times regime trying to understand uh, or rather restrict uh, uh, the disease uh, from getting out of hand. Uh, and this caused a lot of problems. Uh, for one, this was the first major intrusion that the British were doing into Indian society. Until then, the British were tinkering around. They were not intruding into local practices. So when body searches started on trains, uh, you know, people started getting terrified. And most famously in Pune, there was even an assassination of Walter Rand, who was a plague commission official. Uh, so, you know, a lot of pushback happened during the plague. But one of the things that the British had to deliberate early on is, should we be moving the trains or not? You know, and this is a big decision to make in a context of pandemic. Why? Because as I said, in a pandemic, obviously the pandemic happens because somebody or some vector of the disease is moving from one place to another. Right. Without that, you can't. And that is why the standard recommendation is to lock down. That is, if you isolate yourself, obviously the disease has no chance of spreading. Now, the British, while mulling over this question, had this, you know, had to take a decision of whether to shut down the railways or not. Right. And just like our government had to do last year. And what's interesting is that the British eventually ran special trains to actually ferry the migrant workers back home. And their reasoning was that it is, even if they shut down the railways, people would walk back home. That is, it would turn out to be counterproductive, at least with the trains that will reach home in a directed fashion. Whereas if you lock down the trains, the psychology of the migrant worker is such that they will still want to go back home. And note, what is the psychology? Believe it or not, in 1890s, the same thing was heard in the, on the railway platforms as they were heard in 2020. This particular phrase that goes something like, Agar marna hai, to gao mein marenge. which means if you have to die in any case, if due to a pandemic or a health crisis, it makes more sense actually to die in your source village. So this kind of a psychological imperative to go back. And again, it comes from this circular migrant, which is so distinct and unique in India, means that when a pandemic or a health crisis strikes, the first response of people, the first rational response of people is to go back home. And hence, the British actually ran special trains. The city of Bombay halved in population from something like 800,000 to 400,000 in the matter of few months. And not surprisingly, after six or eight months, the migrants came back. Right. So just like as we saw this year, the migrants are now coming back to the cities because ultimately the, the reason for migration was very strong. It was to get an income and so on. And that was as true in 1897 as it was in 2020. I'll give you another example of pandemics and migration. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this is a picture. Again, it looks very similar to what we have today in terms of what we'd call as a PPE. Uh, the plague, of course, was in China for a long time. Uh, some would say that it came to India from Hong Kong uh, and from and it came to Hong Kong from mainland China and so on. Now, the plague, uh, I should specify the pneumonic plague, you know, hit Manchuria, China in uh, 1911. And the response out there was to shut down the railways for migrant workers. Right? I mean, the, the way they did that was that third and fourth class passengers were not allowed to board. And what did you get? Pretty similar scenes as to what we saw in 2020. Again, even in China at that time, you found that migrants chose to walk back home, right? Uh, and so more, I mean, not more, but a lot of people died in China walking back home. And it was January, 1911, peak winter, and so the harsh cold made matters worse. So again, you got a humanitarian crisis in China in 1911 when the railways were shut down with again, no consideration for migrant workers. Again, the, the reason to shut down was very noble. The idea was to curtail the spread of the virus, but in the event, one created a, a very a dangerous crisis for migrants. Uh, 
So coming back now, you know, to this idea of the pandemic, uh, uh, the pandemic coronavirus uh, and migration today, uh, what we saw last year uh, was uh, how do we understand from what we've seen so far of what happened uh, last year? Let me just point out that uh, when the government of India uh, announced this particular lockdown, uh, we had already given many days actually to shut down the airspace. If you notice the difference of how we handled the shutting down of airspace, which was much more gradual as compared to the abrupt shutting down of the Indian railways, you'll realize the difference or nature of the policy response. The other thing is, you know, precisely because the announcement of the lockdown itself did not really have much for what migrant workers ought to be doing, that communication gap meant that it added to this idea of panic among migrant workers. The third sort of problem of the lockdown last year was that there was no credibility after a few weeks about the final date of the lockdown. Right? So for the first, it was announced that it would be there for you know, uh, uh, three weeks. As the third week deadline started approaching, when it was finally extended, migrants who had decided not to walk back lost faith in this whole idea of uh, a deadline on the uh, lockdown. Right? And so this lack of credibility about the expiry date of the lockdown made matters worse because migrants, a lot of them are daily wage, but a lot of them were not receiving incomes from employers. And because the nature of work for many of these migrants is so precarious, that migrants decided that it's better, as we say, agar marna hi hai, to gaon mein marenge. Now, this is the strong psychology of the circular migrant worker in India, whether it was 2020, whether it is 1897. Right? And so that is a powerful takeaway, so to speak, that we, that we see from pandemic history, that is migrants will go back irrespective of what you do. So what should be done? You know, I mean, this is this is the whole uh, idea of if suppose government had given a lot of social security and welfare in the destination, would things have been different? To a certain extent, if they had done it quickly, it would have been different. But I think in some case, in this case, it would have been wiser at that point for India to just let migrants go home first and then enforce the lockdown. Many of us actually did write in the op-ed pieces around the time of the lockdown precisely for this. In the event, the government of India actually did that, do that, but two months down the line. Right? And so we got these shramic trains, special trains to ferry migrant workers back home. And so obviously, this, if this was done two months earlier, we would not have got a full-blown migration crisis. And what the migration crisis actually did last year was it kind of intensified the possibility of the virus to later spread. Why? Because a lot of these migrants found themselves in these camps. They were these, you know, uh, almost like, ref not refugee camps, but uh, 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 humanitarian camps where it was very high density, all the classic conditions for the virus to spread. So what started off with a very noble intention, whether it was China in 1911 or whether it was India in 2020, uh, March, uh, the idea was to contain the virus because pandemics will happen through uh, migration. You need some migration for a pandemic to really explode. Did not really foresee another crisis which immediately erupted. And I would argue that if the migrants had gone back home at that point when infection rates were very, very low, you know, it, things would have been or things would have panned out very, very differently for migrant workers. So how does then one respond to pandemics uh, and migration? Because as we're saying, every pandemic requires some migration and thus to curtail a pandemic, you need to curtail migration. Now, the first point to note is that one can easily curtail international migration. How? We just shut down the airspace, right? International airspace, we shut down even uh, uh, water space in terms of ports and so on. And if you do that, then migrants are forced, Indian migrants in the Gulf or US, they are forced to stay there, right? What it means is that they can't really fly or they can't swim to India. They are stuck out there, as simple as that. The same, however, cannot be done for internal migration, as we realized last year. The simple reason is that unlike an international migrant, the internal migrant can always walk back home. Right? And what the, I think the Indian government were, were hoping is that state boundaries would be sealed. But what we saw last year were people being smuggled across state borders, people walking back from new routes across state borders. Broadly put, even if you're 
trying to curtail internal migration from a very noble point of view, it is never ever going to work in the context of a pandemic, in the context of a hugely circular migrant workforce, in the context of zero or not zero, but you know, virtually no social security available for migrants in the destination regions. As I pointed out over the last one year in a variety of places, uh, the way you should understand the world of the migrant worker is that the migrant is looking at the city for economic security, but is looking to the village for social security. And they're two different kinds. The economic security is the salary, it's the wage. But the social security is the security offered by the family in terms of psychological, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, let's not call it counseling, but support. Uh, and of course, Russian, right? So you get access to the this welfare state only in the source region. Why? Because the migrant in India can access these servants, uh, these services only in the source region. Right? So we don't still have full portability of uh, uh, social security in India. So what should be done in this world of migration and pandemics? Do we have uh, any learning so that in the future we don't make uh, similar mistakes uh, again? So the key, of course, is that migrants in India need portable social security. And the buzzword, of course, for this now is one nation, one Russian card. And in my view, of course, that's a very good thing. Uh, there'll be a lot of teething issues. There's a lot of uh, you know issues in terms of who's going to pay for this. Is it the center? Is it the state? But Russian is only one aspect. And that just gives you food grains and a few other things. But it, the idea of India, uh, the you know, constitutionally, one can move across state borders freely, at least most parts of India. But unfortunately, India, if you move from point A to point B, and especially across state boundaries, state boundaries, then you lose access to a lot of welfare services. And that is why what we need in India is a full-blown architecture for portability of social security, which means whether it's banking, whether it's health, whether it's insurance, whether it's education, one does not lose access to you know, a low cost, maybe subsidized, or in some cases free, uh, uh, handouts which are given by the state government. So if you go from Bihar to Mumbai, there should be a way to kind of access some of the services which were being uh, offered for at a much lower cost in Bihar in Mumbai as well. Now this raises an important point of political economy. That is, why should the Maharashtra state government be entertaining workers from Bihar as well as be paying them welfare? Right? And that is why we need an interstate coordination mechanism in order to smoothen this out and make this idea of portability of social security a reality. What it would do in future pandemics then is that if a pandemic is announced and maybe it's too late to react in March, I think last year we were still early to react, but if it's too late to react and you one has to shut down instantly overnight as it was done last year in the end of March, then portability of social security means that the migrants are still gonna be able to survive those few days and weeks in the cities. In the absence of it, they're definitely going to walk back home. The other thing that the pandemic revealed is the very woeful nature of housing, low cost housing, especially in comparison to China and India, right? And one of the reasons again that migrants left during the pandemic this year is actually rental housing options where the landlords and the landladies evicted people out, right? And so this market in India has never really developed. In India, the housing sector has focused more on ownership based houses and not rental houses. But for these 100 million circular migrant workers in India, the need is rental housing, right? And so this is a huge demand that is not being catered to currently. The last thing we learned in this pandemic is that for a certain class of migrant workers, contractors are very important, right? And what we saw in the pandemic is that these contractors often disappeared. So you had suddenly migrant workers stuck in Bangalore because the contractor is missing. And the contractors, in a way like the Maibap for the migrant worker, which means the contractor knows the local language, is dealing or negotiating on behalf of the workers with the employers. If the contractor disappears, migrants are completely helpless. I mean, think of yourself in a, in a new land where you don't know the language, where you don't have documents, where you don't have currency, you will be paranoid. And that happened with you know, thousands of migrant workers, especially in the construction industry, which have a lot of contractors. And so we need better contractor accountability uh, going forward so that contractors don't end up fleecing migrant workers in this manner. So this is, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now, uh, just to point out again, 
that the last two years have really shown us the significance and scale of this mostly invisible section of Indian society, which is the migrant work, especially the circular migrant work. Right? And what I'm pointing out is that a knowledge of not only migration, but a knowledge of pandemics and a knowledge of the history of both is very, very important, not only for the academic, but also for public policy making. And arguably, if we had known some of this, our own history of dealing with pandemics, maybe, just maybe, we would have thought of you know, uh, giving the migrant workers an opportunity to go back home before the lockdown or think twice before shutting down the railways with a four hour notice period. So I'll end here and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, these are two books which I've written. Uh, I hope you get the opportunity to read them. I also run an internship at IIM Ahmedabad called the History Internship. Uh, and I run a history handle on Instagram and Twitter at the rate biz econ -based. So I'll stop here and happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Tumbe. Thank you very much for this amazing lecture. It was very informative and we got to know a lot about and many of our questions were answered and we raised other questions as well. Uh, so we can uh, move to the question answer session now. We have several comments and questions in the YouTube chat box section. I will show the question in the screen. Uh, I'm not showing the comments. There are many people who wish to good afternoon sure. and everybody. I'll just show the, I'll start with the first question. The first question is by Tulika Banik. Yes, Tulika is asking, uh, people chose migration over action. Is it true? Because of man-made prisons like war and regional fight, number of people run away from homes. Then where is the relevance of Agar Marenge to Gaon Me? Yeah, I think, uh, I think what Tulika is pointing out is of a certain class of workers, who have deliberately escaped. And then for this certain class of workers, definitely there is nowhere else to go or going else means going to a new place, uh, which many migrants do. Um, but I would, uh, where I would differ is on the numbers. You know, that is, if you are saying there are, you know, these tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of migrant workers in India, how many of them belong to this section that Tulika is pointing out who have escaped from wars and famines and so on. Uh, not famines, but you know, natural disasters and so on. And that number in India, though hard to you know pinpoint, is not 100 million for sure. Right? And so this 100 million circular migrant worker that we're talking about, on average, believe it or not, actually has some land back home. You know, the average security guard that you're seeing has some land back home in the village. There is a symbiotic relationship where you have to see the urban and the rural, not as two distinct entities, but as a continuum, right? Where the rural and the urban kind of flow into each other uh, very nicely. And this is happening, this has been happening in India now for more than a hundred years. And that is why this notion that, you know, Gaon Me Marenge, uh, because of most of these migrants, and this is what I really want to leave with you. Most of the guys that you're going to see in the informal space in your cities, believe it or not, are actually going to go back. They're not going to die in the city. They are actually going to go back. They're going to retire back in in the house. If you you might think that the population of the city should fall, it doesn't fall because younger cohorts replace these older cohorts who go back. Right? Think of the classic taxi driver in Mumbai, the UP you know uh, uh, taxi driver, the Bihari taxi driver in Mumbai. They will spend a lot of time in Mumbai, but they will retire back in Bihar. And, right? So that connection is very strong, and that is why this sentiment that we hear in uh, this particular, uh, you know, last year's pandemic. So I think that should, you know, hopefully answer your question that what you're pointing out to is a particular class of workers who you're absolutely right, have nowhere to go. Uh, but that is a very tiny number when you look at India's overall you know, numbers of migrant workers. Hello, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a next question uh, from Shampan Chakraborty. Shampan is asking, uh, sir, can you use reverse migration as a theoretical term which happened during this COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are two terms. There's potentially reverse and there's return, right? So demographers and economists typically use the word return migration. That is, when people are coming back from the Gulf to Kerala, that is called return migration. 
when NRIs who have been in the US for many years suddenly decide to settle down uh, back uh, in, in India, you know, you go to US, you, uh, you study, then you work for five, 10 years, and then you come back to India and you use that dollar wealth and settle down. Is that reverse migration? Well, technically, yes. But the, the, the term that is there, let's call it in the academic literature, is return migration. Right? Uh, re reverse migration was often used last year right? because it was supposed seen to be not a permanent return. Right? And that's why we talk of return migration more in the context of a permanent return. So, yes, I would agree with you that you, know, you can call this particular temporary flight. You know, I've been... For the last one year, I've been pointing out that this is not going to be a permanent reversal, in which case we can start talking of a return migration. But this was a short term reverse migration in which, of course, now what is happening is that that reverse migration has been reversed and a lot of people are coming back to cities. In fact, in most places, a lot of people uh, have come back. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Omi Moitro. Uh, is asking the hardship migrants face during the pandemic is it simply because of bad planning or governments don't see them maybe as a viable vote bank for making crucial policy changes oh uh, great point by abhinaba you know bad planning or no political voice uh, and i would say a bit of both uh, in the sense that uh, let me talk about the second point earlier uh, i use the word invisible you know the the reason why migrant workers are invisible in public policy in India is this, that is, they are not a political, uh, you know, vote catching base. And so there's huge so-called floating populations that are there in major cities like Delhi, Surat, Mumbai. They are not voting in the local elections. Right? So they are, they are typically, in fact, being wooed. So if you see what happens in the Bihar election, they are, in fact, going to Delhi and Mumbai and saying, please come back so that you can vote. Right? Now, in theory, uh, and this is related with this, I've been arguing that we need to move to a system where residents can vote, especially in municipal elections and so on. For example, I have voted, and I can tell you it is so simple actually to get a voting card in India now. It is really seamless in most parts of India. I have voted in Hyderabad municipal elections. I have voted in Ahmedabad. I have uh, voted in Mumbai. So wherever I have moved, I have voted. Unfortunately, this information that you can vote pretty much anywhere in India is absent, or in many cases, you're not allowed to vote. Right. And so in, for, in both the reasons, you know, what you're saying is absolutely right, that these, this, this particular constituency is not seen as a vote catchment uh, place. And that is why often it's, this, this migrant work is often exploited because you don't have a political voice uh, in, in the places that you're going to. Having said that, even if they you know, did have you know, a, a politi some political voice, I think what we saw last year would have still happened in the sense that you know, uh, it's not that... I think what happened last year is that the government relied overly on a pure, you know, scientist based medical advice. And I think what the lesson is that any public policy needs to have not only scientists, of course, you need scientists, but you also need demographers. You need economists to tell you how the economy is going to tank and how to buttress the economy. You need migration experts to tell you that, you know, what is if you're going to shut down the Indian railways, the first category of people who are going to be affected is migrant workers, as simple as that. Yeah. You know, migrant I mean, the bulk of Indian railways is migrant workers. So for many of us who've been working on migration, it was very surprising, the, the manner in which the lockdown was uh, enforced. There's no doubt that it, the good thing about the lockdown was that it was done. That is, you know, something had to be done. And uh, India, compared to, say, Brazil or US, did trust the scientists. But I think we should have also got not only scientists, but also the social sciences, you know, people in that room, in the decision-making room, so that some of the obvious fallouts you know, uh, would have been a surge. For example, the, if there was a communications expert, the speech itself, the lockdown speech, if it had even one sentence for migrant workers, it would have done a huge deal. Right? But I've gone through that speech many times. There was nothing in it for migrant workers. The first time the government started saying something for the migrant workers was five days later. You know, and that, that was quite late. By then, the crisis was already sort of picked up. So a bit of both, a bit of bad planning. Uh, one was the central government, but over time, you'll see also what happened was at the state government level, right? And so here, political parties of different hues, what, what started then was this particular idea that we don't want our people back home because you'll get the disease back, right? And this was a kind of completely race to the bottom kind of situation because who's then, you know, one, one thing is we, we are saying that 
you know migrants are not a political base in the destination regions but what we are saying mm-hmm. there is is that they are not even a political voice in their source region because source regions ideally should have been wooing back these people saying come we will take care of you we will do the appropriate quarantine but what we saw in many state you know uh, state leaders were saying no we are not going to release our state borders we don't want the infection here and that came from this competitive scorecard right? that is everyone wants to show a clean slate and the best way to show a clean slate is to have a complete lockdown and not let the virus mm-hmm. in now i think that was defeat right because you had to get the migrants back you had to follow process yes some cases would have increased but you know you could have controlled it but the messaging again from the state government level was also not you know great uh, and then you know that's how the the crisis unfolded at multiple levels and overall uh, at, you know at some point migrant workers were cursing the central government they were cursing the state government it just seemed that there was literally no politician who was you know standing up uh, for the migrants so quite a bizarre uh, sequence of events which took place last year thank you professor tumbe and even now some of the cab drivers they say that uh, we are not allowed to go back home even our villages have shut doors to us we are not able to meet our families so very tragic situation at the same time yeah i think this idea of you know a lockdown itself and a strict lockdown it's i think operable only at the international migration level where you can actually enforce it what happened was then we are taking this model as you pointed out to the village level you know so villages are village leaders also say no no we don't want anybody to come back now that's a rational response completely rational but if you know half a million villages are doing that in india it's completely self defeat right and so that is why uh, one needs to be sensitive and it is not the case that if a person came then the whole village got it you know you could have basically just kept this person you know in quarantine and that's the process to basically uh, manage ultimately the economy has to move and so you can't have a lockdown for 5 years you know i mean you have to it was going to be it was always going to be a few week or max a few months strategy uh and uh, eventually it had to you know eventually the economy has to uh, get back on track uh, otherwise you'll have more deaths with economic you know devastation uh, than the pandemic itself yeah it's exactly yeah. and uh, i mean uh, am i audible or is it echoing my voice i can hear you so uh, last year if you had shut down the airport so do you think uh, like in the beginning like before march itself before like <laughs> the airspace i mean people came from china it's so because everyone yeah. is blaming the china now yeah. so do you think if the airspace was closed before march itself the international airspace uh, do you think we could have prevented a massive a huge outbreak i mean you know, this this question falls into what research is called hindsight bias right so with the benefit of hindsight we should have just shut down the airspace in january you know that is that would have been ideal but i think since we have all lived through it we have to reflect and ask ourselves were we serious in in february you know none of us uh, you know uh, really cared about the virus or what is happening around the world yes. it is literally it is literally when the who announced on march 11 12 that this is a pandemic you know, that this is a pandemic yes changed the sort of uh, situation around the world but having said that you know kerala had started early now the reason why kerala had a lead across other states was because they tackled this nipa virus which was in 2018 mm-hmm. they, they had some kind of they had a recent yeah. experience and this is why what i'm arguing in my book of the history of pandemics is that we need to start systematically teaching people that is medical schools general population the history of pandemics in india you know these pandemics which i'm talking about in my book they kill 70 million people around the world or 40 million in india they kill 20 million people in a few months in 1918 and yet my guess is that not many people have learned about this not many people i mean you've probably heard more of the jallianwala bag tragedy of you know 1919 which is also you know, the name of this group uh, but if you if you taken a few months back 20 million indians died but we know more about the tragedy than influenza pandemic and because it's happening 100 years after that collective memory of that brutal period of pandemics in india's past has been completely wiped out the only one place in india which had recent memory was kerala because of the nipa virus but you see what happened in china you see what happened in vietnam and east asia in general east asia has been the best performing region of the world in terms of containing the virus they have the lowest cases as well as a uh, deaths per capita and that's because they've been exposed to this sars and other you know uh, flu related sort of uh, epidemics uh, in the last 20 years so the population was very quick to understand the gravity of the matter 
and they were also willing to submit to this idea of the lockdown or you know quick up checks so that is why kerala had this early start that is why east asia had an early start but the rest of the country with no experience for 100 years of a pandemic with collective memory of past pandemics wiped out uh, thought it was a joke so i was in ahmedabad and you know uh, donald trump had come here uh, and there was this massive uh, speech and the public was encouraged to go on the streets to receive the the president and just a few weeks later we were told not to go to the streets so public policy changed from you know getting people onto the streets to moving a people away from the streets in the matter of a few weeks uh, but to be precise to you uh, you know to to answer your question more precisely uh, could we have done things earlier yes but that's that's the case for everything right and so uh, i'm not going to fault the government for not taking a decision in in february or march i think nobody in the world really saw it coming and because of this thing about you know not being not having uh, recent memory apart from kerala uh, you know i think i think uh, we uh, what we eventually did was right but we messed up big time on the migration front and that's why we got this migration crisis so that's how i see if you ask me you know how would i rate the government's performance uh, on cer- certain things good and on certain things you know very bad yes and you were talking about the collective memory but uh, maybe not in india but in other places like in the african countries or in the middle eastern countries we had the ebola the sars and the mars so like how they have reacted to the covid-19 pandemic because maybe like kerala they also have uh, some kind of uh, experience in that yeah absolutely and so that is why sub saharan africa believe it or not is also on par with east asia not uh, slightly worse than east asia i mean the two best performing regions of the world are sub saharan africa and east asia right and so east asia is relatively rich sub saharan africa is very poor uh, and so um, middle east and north africa you know that belt which is called mena middle east and north africa is not doing as well as east asia but you know one of the things i'm writing in my book is that when we look at a scorecard of deaths or whatever and we look at regional variation there is a temptation to say that you know if you've got less it's because you have taken measures right and what the history of pandemic suggests is that pandemic management is only one part of the story of how many people die right it could be so many other reasons and i'll give you an example of the plague in india plague killed a lot of indians in western india in central india and northern india but plague hardly ever gripped calcutta in the same way it gripped punjab for 20 years you know it came to calcutta it was bad uh, but it was not very bad compared to many other parts eastern india east of calcutta practically not there southern india again very less okay and uh, you know at that time officials were patting themselves saying you know we have defeated plague and so on it turns out that eastern india and southern india didn't have or were got lucky because they don't have the kind of rats and fleas that are necessary for efficient plague transmission it's it was a ecological system which was different in eastern and southern india now cholera was mainly an eastern indian disease it was endemic in eastern india mm-hmm. so if it was not happening in punjab it was not because punjab had managed cholera it was something about the disease itself and i think we are going to learn much more in the next 5 or 10 years about covid which we don't know yet right and so it could just be the case that there are some other set of factors which is leading to less deaths in sub saharan africa or east asia and so we have to be patient and and wait all we know is that there are certain precautions that can be taken like wearing a mask and so on and that's all that one can do and the suppose if this is not the last pandemic we'll have maybe many more in the near future that's what experts are saying <laughs> and you we have few more questions uh, i'll show you them in the screen sure. uh, Pro- pratim dash is asking uh, the covid-19 pandemic causing a shift in migration rhetoric this new migration rhetoric caused a threat to economics especially job losses as well as change in the nature of jobs but the policy makers but the policy makers did not take much action in this regard now what do you think about this effect of migration yeah uh, not fully clear to me the question i think the question is uh, is the pandemic changing the nature of jobs and how to prepare migrant workers for it maybe that is what the question is is trying to imply all i'll say is that you know uh, the migrant workers themselves the jobs that they are doing cannot be done from home right in the sense that uh, 
you know, my job can be done pretty much anywhere. Right? So I am in one of those professions, academia, which is a very cushy profession. I have, you know, I have not had any problems in 2020. But the bulk of India and definitely the bulk of India's migrant workforce, circular migration, cannot work from home. Which means the nature of the job is that you cannot, in a pandemic, you're basically unemployed and you have a massive income decline, right? Or you, you don't have, you, it's, it's a climb down on the economic ladder. And so the pandemic has been brutal economic wise last year for a huge section of India, especially migrant workers. And that is why it makes sense now for to get the economy moving back. So either we need the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus, or we definitely need people to come back to cities and work, complete the construction projects which they had started last year and so on. Because this class of migrant workers, you can't say go and learn digital stuff and you know overnight uh, become a, a, a digital you know, skilled India person. It's not gonna happen. That's just not feasible. You know, uh, the skill set requirements are so different. Uh, and the numbers are so stark, we're talking about tens of millions of people, that there is, in my view, no option but to basically you know, go back to the economic stuff that was happening uh, earlier. So I've not understood the question fully, but you know, I think this is what uh, I, can, I can say. Okay, uh, now to another question. Uh, are we lacking the transparency in maintenance of positive cases? I think there are two things. One is cases and one is deaths, right? I think what we can say is that the deaths, a lot of people said, you know, the deaths are low in India because nobody's reporting it. Uh, 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 and of course, others will say that, you know, uh, the death reporting is fantastic. Now, obviously, the truth is in between in the sense if 150,000 are reported COVID deaths, I can tell you that the number is actually more than that. But is it 1.1 times more or is it 10 times more? That's a huge difference, right? So if it's 10 times more, that's going to be 15, 15 lakh. Now, I don't think there are 15 lakh deaths of COVID in India for the simple reason that if you see the history of past pandemics, where we've also gone through this, when you have mass deaths, the entire statistical system to report deaths breaks down, right? And you can, you'll see it reflected in somewhere. Where will it be reflected? I mean, nobody's going to hide dead bodies at home. It's going to be there in cremation grounds. It's going to be there in burial grounds. Right? And you can see this data. And so researchers, believe it or not, demographers are keeping a tab on this in their own private ways. And we are not really seeing a major spike, right? So I am going to be, I mean, I take this view that at least on deaths, there is no, it doesn't seem that there's, you know, major underreporting going on. Now on cases, you know, it's an open question, but precisely because, you know, this disease can be so asymptomatic, it could be the case that I've got COVID and I don't even know. Right? And so that's why it kind of confuses this thing about cases so much. Some say, you know, a lot of India actually already got COVID, which is asymptomatic. So what is, what is when we see the number of cases, it's only those who are actually testing, right? So it could be the case mm -hmm. that the case under reporting is in fact substantial, but what we should be concerned about is of course, eventually deaths, right? Now, for example, you look at Kerala. Kerala, the number of cases has gone tremendously up. But they have this test, uh, 3D system, testing, tracing, and all of that in place, and they have a good health, public health system. The number of deaths per capita is actually one of the lowest in Kerala and India. Right? So they have allowed cases to go up, but not deaths to go up. I think that's the useful strategy. That is, after a point, you realize that the impact of the getting it is actually not so much. And in fact, the quicker that happens, the quicker even the fear of the disease slows down, which means if you get it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will die. And I think those, those particular things, what we're calling as case fatality rates, have been sharply falling across the world because of better knowledge about the disease, better treatments, uh, and so on. So yes, of course, there is underreporting of cases. I don't think substantial, but I would be more concerned if there was substantial underreporting of deaths, uh, which in my view is you know not happening. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have also other questions uh, from Pratim as well, I think, uh, yes. Uh, just show it. just a second. Yeah, I have been reading an article, but I found another interesting thing during pandemic. Particularly, Germany took a different approach to protect its economy, like a, like the early announcement of aid or early imposition of content ban prevented mass migration. Do you think the application of these methods can curtail internal mass migration in India during COVID nineteen? I think it's going to be very tough. I think our 
as I pointed out, our internal migration system is completely different from the German system. I would say it's also different from the Chinese system. The only real comparison of our scale of migration is China, right? And as I pointed out, there's a slight difference. China, there's you know much better. I mean, let's just say it's less circulatory in China than in India. Having said that, you know, China got very lucky. Every year, hundreds, not tens, hundreds of millions of migrant workers in China take the trains back home and celebrate their, you know, the the new year uh, out there, right? Uh, this year, as it so happened, when they locked down Wuhan, uh, these migrant workers were already back home because this was part of their national holiday, right? So they they got very lucky that at the time of the lockdown, yeah. people were already back home. It was just a pure coincidence of of timing. Uh, as I pointed out, when they tried to do that in 1911, when they shut down the railways, it led to a crisis, just as what we got last year. Right. So China is, I think, China is the real relevant comparison. In Germany, it's very different. They don't have this pressure of circular migration. If there's lockdown, people have the holding capacity to stay out of the crisis in the city. Why? Because you have social security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In India, the, the reason people want to go back home, apart from the psychological reason, is that there's no money. Right. How do you survive? I mean, there is a real concern of, of, of feeding yourself. Uh, and so if that is taken care of in Germany, you know, you're not going to get the pressure to move back. In India, over after a period of point, they said, okay, I don't mind work staying for one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month. But then beyond that, you know, it becomes uh, a, a, a quite a sort of uh, a pressure point. And that's why a lot of migrants eventually left. Yes, thank you for the Thank you so much. So, like, I will see many of our participants have thanked you for your answers. Uh, we don't have any more questions now. I just want to ask you uh, so, with this vaccination that started today itself, so what do you think the kind of migration will happen now? Uh, what will you call it academically? What will the term, you know, what can the term we use? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question fully. You're saying if more people will come because of the vaccination or? Uh, I mean, uh, many people will come back also from their villages to the cities for getting vaccination. Or maybe some people will go back to their villages to get registered and get the vaccination there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this. See, I mean, as I said, as part of the circular migration, uh, people are going back home usually once a year. But often it could be twice or thrice a year. So I think you should see this as... Just how as a migrant would come back home when there's a marriage in the family, right? That's a classic reason as to why a migrant would, you know, say take leave from work and say gao jana because either a wife has delivered, so you know you want to go back home because you've just become a parent, or uh, uh, you know, in the like in the case of Virat Kohli, for example, most famously uh, recently who came back from Australia. Uh, but so I think you should see this if it's just vaccination, it's just literally coming for a day, right? And so. I think that's a very small, I don't think we need a special term for that. I think it's just part of the usual rituals. It could be festivals or it could be, uh, you know, festivals, the classic case as to why migrants come back, especially during Holi. Uh, but I think I think one should see it just part of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just last question from my side. Uh, this uh, From your book, India Moving, you have uh, talked about the indentured laborer migration uh, to the coal mines and everywhere from the Chotanagpur plateau regions. So like, uh, as I'm working on that area, I just, from out of curiosity, I want to know, uh, is there any pandemics like reported in that period, uh, like because of the pandemics, people are moving to the coal mines or moving as indentured laborers? Is there any kind of, I mean, we can find in history? Uh, I, I, I... To the best of my knowledge, maybe there's no written evidence, but I'm quite sure it has happened in the sense that if you just look at the pandemics, whether it's cholera, plague or influenza, uh, mm -hmm. plague would be the one. You know, I think what you need to look at is plague because plague happened between, you need to look at plague with 1900, 1910. Uh, uh, and I have a working paper out, which is on my website. It's called Pandemics and Historical Mortality in India. You'll see these charts, which I have, which are province level charts, and it tells you when these numbers go up. Right. And so I know for a fact, for example, plague was such a big part of South Bihar, and I'm pretty sure, you know, what you call as Jharkhand uh, and so on now, uh, that a lot of towns were emptied out. And so you'd also have small towns of India emptied out, not just the big cities. And people mm -hmm. going back to villages. 
in the case of plague by the way what's interesting is even there was even evacuation from the villages that is the classic way to beat plague was to camp outside the village so you had this mass evacuation strategy during those about 10 or 15 years of the plague in north india uh, so you might find some very interesting things about the mines uh, you'll definitely find evidence of work being stopped because of the plague you know that was a very constant what we call as lockdown now the world was not locked then, but definitely when a lot of people got sick a lot of people left it was as good as a lockdown in the sense nobody ventured out and right? so you, you can call it silent streets which was pretty much what we okay. saw okay so okay so it's definitely happened and now i don't you know uh, i can't rec recollect any piece which has written specifically about pandemics and migration in the context of indian labor uh, uh, i'm just repeat one one more your uh, the working paper of that is in your website yeah it's called pandemics and historical mortality in, in india and it will show you a bunch of time series so you can see for yourself when are the peak years uh, and accordingly do research you know the uh, okay. documents that so you look at annual reports of say the a, a coal company classically you know coal companies would have annual reports or the managing agencies which ran these and they'll have something you know like spencers in south india had this year uh, this so they'll tell you something about the year and they'll tell you how business operations were affected so that's a classic source historians would look at to find out how business or economy was affected uh, because of the pandemic uh, so this annual reports of the coal companies did you find them in the archives they will be there in many archives uh, some of them might be shareholder speeches might be in the newspapers uh, so so this is on my website on my google site i also have something called history links and so if, for anybody who likes to do historical research uh, you should basically check out this google site of mine there are tons of resources on history so you can look at you know a lot of potential sources uh, and find information for example i know uh, the jadavpur university for example has uh, digitized all the minutes of the bengal chamber of commerce right and it's all freely available online and this is about 100 years of biannual meetings so if you just look at important years of pandemics you'll find something that the bengal chamber of commerce is mentioning about how the pandemic has disrupted commerce thank you so much thank you for this information yeah. okay pratimesh share the site uh, thank you pratim thank from all of us of viewers and participants as well uh, we have one more question from tulika bani if you are ready with it if we can yeah sure yeah yeah Uh, our country is mainly dependent on agriculture but nowadays our government likes to focus on industries rather than agricultural developments is it another reason for migration of villagers this is a long lasting question of development and in my book i pitched this as a gandhi versus ambedkar debate ambedkar saying we need more migration more industrialization more urbanization and gandhi saying we need more village development more rural development and eventually no migration right and so this question is kind of pitched in the gandhian framework that is you know how do we keep people in indian agriculture if we only invested enough in agriculture there would be no reason for people to leave that's the sort of assumption i think in this question the historical evidence around the world within india shows that as you prosper in agriculture you leave agriculture you know this is one of the most stylized facts of development right and so when you when you actually improve this is kind of counterintuitive when you improve agricultural prospects people become rich and eventually don't do agriculture you might own the land in the village but you move away to the smallest town you move to a, a big city and then you might hold the land and lease it out you might have the land for attachment purposes but you yourself do not do agriculture right and so what i'm going to sort of answer is that with more rural development often you get more rural to urban migration and this is not just an invention this is what we saw in european history this is what we saw in coastal andhra history this is what we are seeing in kerala history kerala has amazing agriculture yet people are leaving right uh, what i will of course say is that there are places in india where agriculture is not doing well and that is a reason for you know some migration so it's about the quality of migration we want aspiration based migration and not distressed driven migration and when we invest in agriculture we move distress migration to aspiration migration and and that should be the aim but the aim should not be to curtail migration per se it should be to enhance the quality of migration because migration is inevitable and it's important 
for a country to move away from agriculture to industry and services in the long run, because that's how countries eventually become prosperous. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any more questions today for today, but I will once again show this site for our participants. Sure. And also, if you have any questions or any other comments, you can contact Professor Tumbe. I think you have your contact details in the site given. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for this lovely afternoon. We got to learn so much. Thank you very much, uh, our participants as well, for joining us today. On behalf of our team, Comparatives, Calcutta Comparatives 1919, I'd like to extend our warm thanks to you for this lovely afternoon. Thank you for Thank joining you. us today. Thanks a lot for having me, Uma. Thank you so much. And a very good afternoon as well. And uh, our, for our participants, we'll announce our next lectures on our social media handles and our website. Please stay tuned for further updates. Thank you so much.